Hi, my name is John Fiorino. I'm the secretary for the William Patterson Society of Professional Journalists. And welcome and thank you all for coming with Dennis Gorman, this uh, guest for the Reality Check series. Woo! Dennis is a veteran sports writer, and he's been one of the very first friends of our chapter here. He helped us get in with uh, the New Jersey Devils. We shadowed him and uh, covered a sport, uh, covered a hockey game, and really did all went through all the motions of an actual sports writer. We went to the post game interview. We watched the game from the press box, and uh, it was really just an incredible experience to be a part of. And hopefully, even though you all couldn't be there, you'll get a real inside look about sports journalism here tonight. And uh, really, without further ado. Dr. Hershon, Dennis Gorman, thank you all again. Thank you, John. Thank you, John, and welcome, everyone. My name is Nick Hershon. I'm an assistant professor of communication here at William Patterson. And thank you all for joining us for tonight's Hobart Reality Check with sports writer Dennis Gorman. Uh, this is part of a speaker series sponsored by the communication department under the leadership of Dr. Rob Quick and the student chapter of the Society of Professional Journalists. Our goal is to hear from professional journalists who can offer insights into how the news business works and advice for students like you. So before we get started tonight, I'd like to let you know we do have one more reality check coming up before the end of the semester, and we hope you'll join us again to hear from Meryl Gottlieb. She's the social video editor for Business Insider, and she'll be here on Wednesday, May 2nd, 6 o'clock right here in the Martini Room. Uh, and let you know what's going on tonight. So as usual, I'll begin our conversation with some questions for Dennis. But at some point, I want you guys as the audience to get involved too. So you can ask questions on social media. If you've been to one of these before, you know that in the second half, we put the questions up on the screen behind you. So if you're on Twitter, we invite you to tweet along questions for Dennis tonight using hashtag Hobart Reality Check. Okay, hashtag Hobart Reality Check. And we'll put some of them on the screen in the second half and Dennis will be able to respond to those. Um, and before, again, we get started, I always want to thank Rod Holiday, Bree Testa, and Maria Zuniga, Sarah Douglas are all helping us run social media or doing some prep for us tonight, so we appreciate that. Uh, now, introduce, introduce uh, our guest. Dennis Gorman is a freelance sports reporter based in New York City, where he primarily works for the Associated Press covering the National Hockey League's New Jersey Devils, New York Islanders, and New York Rangers. He has also covered college basketball, the NBA, UFC, boxing and swimming for the Associated Press. Prior to joining the AP, Dennis worked for the New York Post. He has also written for Newsday, the New York Daily News, the Pittsburgh Tribune Review, the Raleigh News and Observer, Canadian Press, Los Angeles Times, and Yahoo Sports. And in his career, he has covered events such as the 2012 and 2014 Stanley Cup Finals, the 2013 Major League Baseball All-Star Game at City Field, the NCAA Men's Basketball Tournament, college football, and the NFL. Uh, but as John said before, Dennis is also really, truly a friend of our WP SPJ chapter because he helped us at one of our very first events back in November, and we'll show some uh, photos on the screen of that in a second, uh, when we went as a chapter to cover a New Jersey Devils game November 11th last year when they took on the Florida Panthers. Um, and so some of these photographs that we'll put up on this screen show Dennis and some of our members, student journalists, and you see John there and Jack and Alex and Ryan um, all talking with Dennis beforehand as he prepared his notes for the game. Uh, John and Dennis in the press box together going over John's story. Um, and we were able to, uh, there's areas with Jack um, editing their story together. Uh, and then I think we have a, maybe a photo from the post-game press conference. We actually went to see the Devils coach as he did this post-game presser, uh, which is really cool. You see the backs of everybody's heads there. But this is an experience that is really uh, what SPJ is all about and why I think it's so important for those of you who aren't in it already, get involved. You get to network with professionals like this, but also see if this kind of a career is right for you. You learn a little bit behind the scenes. Um, so again, we really thank Dennis, not only for being here tonight, but for his friendship with us of doing some of that going out of the way. So, Again, thank you very much, Dennis, for all you've, you've done for us. So if I could just give him another round of applause for that. Um, all right. Um, so we're going to go through a bunch of questions to start before we get to some of the student questions. Uh, one of the things, if you can, again, demystify a lot of this for students who have never attended a game, don't know what it's like because it was an experience for us when we were at that Devils game, 
Can you walk us through like the average game day, first of all, your preparation as a reporter, uh, just from the moment you get to the arena, what time do you get there? What do you do? And just kind of in as much detail as you think is important. Well, <clears throat> well, it, it depends, you know, with AP, because usually we don't have to write an early story, an early being a story before the game. Uh, so I will, so I don't have to go for like morning skates unless there's a specific question one of our other writers and one of our other markets needs me to get from to ask a player or a coach. So usually I'll try to get to whether it's Prudential Center or Barclays Center, Madison Square Garden, right around four o'clock because that's when the doors open for media. Uh, from there I'll get the game notes and I'll essentially start going through them. You know, is there anything interesting coming up? Is there anything noteworthy coming up? Is there a trend? You know, have you know, have the New Jersey Devils won seven in a row? Have the New York Islanders lost twelve in a row? Something that stands out. And then so I'll, I'll research that. Um, I'll go through, you know, I'll go through the numbers, go through the data to kind of find some trends, something interesting that I can kind of use in my story. Um, from there, I'll read, I'll read online, you know, whether it's NHL.com or Newsday or The Record or the New York Post, or whoever the out-of-town team is. I'll, I'll read one of their outlets just to get an idea of what's going on. And then from there, it's just watching the game, kind of paying attention to what's happening, and then kind of crafting different versions of the story in my head and typing something out as the game goes along because I have to file a first version story right when the game ends, right? Literally, when the clock hits zero, I have to have a story into my editors. Mm -hmm. So, you, and hopefully it's in English. Um, and then from there, it's just kind of going into the locker rooms, talking to players, talking to coaches, getting additional information, and then kind of crafting a final version story. So what is your deadline on stories like that? You know, a game ends at 9.30, the fans file out. When do you have to have your story in? Because you still need to interview players and coaches and things. Well, you know, like I said, my first version story has to be sent right when the game ends. And usually my second version story, I will try to have it in maybe an hour and a half later. So this, uh, with AP, we have to get it out as fast as possible. So you want it to be something that's good, a good clean read that's compelling, but you can't take all night to write it, you know, because you, eventually you're going to get an editor who calls up screaming, where's the story? I need the story. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that you think most of you know, student journalists, maybe when you were a student journalist, that you wouldn't know about this process, that you've since learned, something that surprises you about how it works? Yeah, I never... When I worked at my student paper at St. John's, we were a weekly, so you had a full week to write your story. So you could write and go back and rewrite and rewrite and try to make it as pretty as possible. Now when, when you're doing this at a professional level where you have hard deadlines, you have to write as fast and as clean as possible. That I can't tell my editor, yeah, you asked for a story at zeros, but I really wanted to write about how uh, uh, Taylor Hall's, the wind blew through Taylor Hall's ha hair as he sped down the left wing. My editor's going to say, I don't care about that. That doesn't tell me anything. Mm -hmm. He's just going to say, I need the words. Mm -hmm. um, one of the other things that I think our you know, students got to experience is that you get up really close to the players. I mean, we didn't get quite into the players' locker room, but we were right near the coach. And even when we were in the media lounge before the game, we saw the broadcasters walking in, former mm -hmm. players. So you're kind of up close to a lot of fame. And I think this is a useful lesson for a student journalist who may grew up like, you know, rooting for the Devils. Now you're right there with the Devils players. How do you handle that? Because you don't want to be a fangirl or fanboy. Uh, but you may just be in awe, like, oh, my God, there's so-and-so right in front of me. So how do you deal with that? You almost have 
well, you, you do don't have to kind of turn off the fan aspect, right? Because you, you can see, you know, great players, you know, great people and, you know, pe great athletes of, you know, bygone generations in, in the media room. And like you said, you don't want to be that fan who's gushing over them because they're there to do a job and you're there to do a job. You, you almost have to treat them as if they were just, I'd say, another person, you know, on the street. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, and when you get to know them, that's really what they are. They're just people. It's, you know, no different than you and I, maybe just a few more dollars in their bank account. Mm -hmm. But... But, you know, they, I don't think they, a lot of them want to be gushed over. Right. One of the other things when you talk about your process, I don't know if we talked a lot about social media there. Um, so that's now a whole new element of the game. It's not just yeah. worrying about writing your game story, but throughout the game you're tweeting updates. And So how do you operate as far as, like, how many tabs do you have open on your computer? What are you focusing on? Is it, you know, game story comes before all else? Is it a little bit of both? It, to me, it's a little bit of both. I mean, um, I'll have TweetDeck open during the game so I can tweet out um, information or some terrible, terrible jokes. Um, those of you who follow me know I write terrible jokes. Um, but if it's the third period of a 2-1 hockey game, I'm going to be focused on my story. Um, it's just because my... My first responsibility is to my editors and to the people, and to the subscribers of the AP, and to the people that are depending on getting that story. Mm -hmm. So, you know, at that point, I'm not going to write a pun about, you know, a Taylor Hall pass. <laughs> Um, I think you're also the first person who's come as part of our Reality Check series who has been a pure freelancer. Yeah. We've had people who are kind of permalancers. They work on a per diem basis, uh, but you are completely freelance, which means you're, you know, contractor for hire. So what does that entail exactly? Again, for people here who may not really know what the life of a freelancer is like. It's, a, it's an interesting life because, you know, obviously I, w I work for the AP, but I also work for the Pittsburgh Tribune Review uh, and, and other outlets. So a lot of it is pitching ideas to different outlets, you know, Pitching an idea, pitching a story, pitching an availability. Uh, I give you an example. Recently, I just emailed the sports editor at the Pittsburgh Tribune Review, and I said, "Look, um, if you need help when the Pittsburgh Pirates come up to play the New York Mets, I'm available. Mm -hmm. uh, if the Giants, New York Giants, and New York Jets draft Saquon Barkley from Penn State when they have his initial press conference here, I can go. I can get you a story. You know if." The Penguins having to play the doubles in the playoffs. If you need help, I'm available. So it's just kind of thinking ahead, thinking what an editor would need or would want. Um, some of it's also, you know, so it's thinking, it's thinking like that. It's also thinking what stories you think might be cool for, for a specific outlet. And some of it's also working on your own projects because you don't have to go into an office and say, okay, today I have to cover the New York Islanders' 14th loss in a row. Sorry about that, Professor Hershaw. Yeah. I'm um, an Islanders fan, so he knows that, and he's using it against me. I am. Uh, <laughs> um, but, you know, I can, I can work on something like, okay, maybe I can do a piece on Matt Barzell, or, you know, why, you know what's, going, what's gone wrong with the Islanders, or, and I can pitch it out to different outlets. So and I think there's a value to that. Sure. Um, how about your interaction with some of these athletes and coaches? Is that part of making you a more reliable or wanted freelancer because they see that you have a good rapport with some of those athletes, coaches, you can get information from them that maybe other freelancers can't? Yeah. Just when I, when I pitch to people, I'll say I'm credentialed with the New York Islanders. I'm credentialed with the New York Rangers. I'm credentialed with the New Jersey Devils. <coughs> so it makes it easier for those that for whatever outlet I, I'll be working for to say okay yeah I'll have him cover cover something or work on work on that story instead of someone who's never kind of gone through that process where the team doesn't know the team 
media relations department doesn't know the person. If they know the person, I think there's more of a inherent trust factor that that, that person's going to be a professional. Mm -hmm. um, and we have some videos that I'd like to queue up to show you actually at work, and then yeah. we'll talk about them on you know on the other side, but. Um, the first video, I will introduce it, is from the ACC basketball tournament that was held at Barclays Center. Uh, so you covered a lot of those games, and one of the games was the Pittsburgh men's team losing to Notre Dame. And you were at the post-game press conference where you asked the coach, Kevin Stallings, about his job performance, whether he thought his job might be on the line because they had just lost this major game. Um, so I want to be able to watch this video. We'll put it up there, and then we'll talk on the other side about some of the lessons we can learn from this kind of interaction between a reporter and a source at a press conference. Okay. Last question, back right. Kevin, do you feel like you have to sell your bosses on your vision in order to come back next year? Um, I doubt it. I, 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 mean, I, think I, know, I think they know what my vision is. I, I think that's already been communicated. So um, I, I doubt if that really is something that plays into it. but. Again, I could be wrong. I don't. I don't know. And and um, uh, we've recruited great kids and guys that of, of great character. And and uh, we had to we had to turn over a, an entire roster. And um, um, we knew this was going to be a little bit of a tough season. We didn't know it would be this tough. We didn't know we would lose Ryan. But it is what it is. And and um, uh, I, I'm certainly not ashamed of it or apologetic for it. I, I'm, I'm proud of these guys. I, I'm proud of their, their character and their efforts and who they are as human beings and what they've done in the classroom and what they've done in the community and all, all the great things that they've done that, that haven't, that don't show up in a, in a final score on, on, in, during a game or after a game. So can you tell us, you asked him this question about his job security yeah. and what happened the next day? He was fired. Uh, <laughs> He, uh, Pitt had gone 0-19 in, Atlantic, in the Atlantic Coast Conference, the first team ever to go winless in conference play. And the last, I guess, month, month and a half of Pitt's regular season, there had been a lot of speculation that he was going to be fired because the team was setting all kinds of records for, for futility in that season. Uh, fans weren't showing up for the home games. It was just an awful scene. And so they lose this game that they honestly should have probably won. And, you know, Kevin wanted to talk about basketball, but honestly, whether basketball wasn't the story. The story was his job status and whether or not he was, he f was going to return, whether he felt he should return. And uh, I felt like I had to press him on that issue. Is If he felt, th did he feel like he needed to sell or his vision to his bosses after a year where they went 0-19 and, and arguably the best college basketball conference in the nation. Mm -hmm. And so we've had previous guests talk about when they're interviewing people in traumatic situations, they've just been the victims of a crime, or they've just lost a loved one or something like that. And we don't usually face that in sports as much, right. but you still have situations where you're asking people about whether they could be fired, uh, they just had a terrible game. Then we do have, of course, injuries in sports and people's seasons ends or careers are ending. Uh, so is it challenging sometimes because you're worried about the reaction that a coach might have, like when you ask a question like that? I'm actually not worried about the reaction because I have to do my job. You know, if he gets mad, if he feels a question's unfair, I'm sure he can, he can pull me aside later and tell me, I'm a jerk, or other colorful language. Mm -hmm. uh, but in, in a room full of journalists, I felt like I had to ask that question because it's the only really viable question to ask at that point. Mm -hmm. I, you know, whether they were two for 12 from the three-point line is irrelevant. You know, the, the only relevancy there is, are you, are you concerned you're going to be fired? Sure. Yeah, and we don't see it in that clip, but something that I've talked to students about, and I wonder if you see it in sports press conference settings, is that now that press conferences like this are either televised or they appear on YouTube later, they're on the team's website later, that sometimes the reporters try to like become part of the media event and they almost show off in the way that they ask a question or they make very long questions just so they can get you know, more airtime. 
Have you seen that or do you try to battle that in some way? I have seen that and it is, um, it, it's an annoyance and it's, it's offensive because we're not the story. They're the story. We're supposed to tell the story. So uh, if I ask a question, I try to keep it as as, as tight as possible, as very as, as as quick as possible, because I'm asking them to answer a question, and I want them to be the ones to tell the story, you know, or, or share their insights. My insights don't matter for anything. Sure. Um, well, we have another video that I want to show of Dennis at work. Uh, and this next clip, Rod will cue it up, is when the Pittsburgh Penguins came to New York to play the Rangers at Madison Square Garden. And the Penguins coach, Mike Sullivan, used to be the assistant coach for the Rangers when they were building their title contending team. So he was part of them you know, becoming Stanley Cup contenders. By the time that he had come back at the time of this clip, the Rangers were in the middle of a rebuild and they were mm -hmm. trading a lot of their top players this past season um, or ongoing season, actually. Uh, so we'll play this clip and again talk on the other side about some of the lessons to be learned from this kind of interaction between reporter and source. It's that you coached here and you coached against the Rangers. Is it strange to see them kind of go all in on a rebuilding process? I don't know. I don't know if it's if it's strange. It's obviously a decision that their management team uh, has made, and uh, but but they still have good players. They've got good young players here. Uh, you know, my my experience here coaching with the Rangers was nothing but positive. It was a it was a terrific experience. We had some really good teams, and they still have some players here that that were part of that. Uh, this is a really good team we're playing. So there were a few things I know you wanted to talk about with this clip. Uh, one of which is that mostly we associate press conferences with this kind of press availability of a coach with just asking hard news questions. Uh, how did the team perform? The kind of things that are going to your game story that you were talking about at the start of our discussion. But then sometimes also you're thinking about things for the future, yeah. um, stories that you're going to write that are going to be in more detail, feature stories and things like that. So what sort of lessons do you think you can learn from that? Yeah, well, that, that took place after a morning skate at Madison Square Garden. And at that point, the game hasn't been played yet. So you can ask more featurey type questions uh, because you're, you're not asking, you know, you know, what did you see in the game? You know, did your team, why do you think your team played well or didn't play well? So this is a time where you can a ask a coach a question where he, he, or a player a question where they can go into some, some detail. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really important of knowing kind of the, knowing when and if when to ask questions. Mm -hmm. Well, and also in sports, there's kind of cliche kind of features. What kind of things are you looking for for a feature story? What do you think makes uh, a good sports uh, feature? I, I want something that goes in depth. I want something that's more, uh, that's not, you know, um, Johnny, John Tavares has scored 12 goals in 12 straight games. He's such a great hockey player. I want to know his process, what he's thinking, what he's seeing. Um, what his teammates see, you know. I, I want to kind of go beyond just the obvious because anyone can write the obvious. It, that's not difficult. But I want to know, I, I want to kind of go into their head, in, into their brain, and kind of pull out what they see, what they think, what they feel. Mm -hmm. and, and that's, to me, is what makes a really good feature. All right. um, I'm going to get to the student questions in a second, so for sure. sure, if you have any questions, make sure you're using hashtag Hobart Reality Check. Just give you one more minute to do that while I ask uh, you about this. Kind of the future of sports journalism and what's going on right now. So we're seeing the kind of day of the newspaper sports page is dying out, and we have a lot of sports websites, most notably The Athletic starting up and hiring away a lot of the top sports writers at local newspapers around the country, um, having a subscription-based model online. So what do you kind of predict to be the, someone on the inside, predict to be the future of sports journalism? Is it positive, negative, and why? I think it's positive. I mean, I think outlets like The Athletic, like DK Pittsburgh Sports in Pittsburgh, Boston Sports Journal in Boston, those outlets will, will, will exist, but I think newspapers will exist just in a different form. They'll be a digital product. It'll be nypost.com. It'll be uh, nj.com or northjersey.com or newyorktimes.com. Uh, 
maybe the physical copy of the newspaper won't exist and it probably won't within my parents' lifetimes, but I think you'll, you'll have, the, uh, the product will be more digital. It'll come on your phone, it'll come on your tablet, it'll come on your smartwatch. So it's just a matter of how the product gets delivered. Does that change the content in any way? See, I, I, I don't think so. I still think you need to have quality content. I think it just means the reporter has to do will have to do more and it'll be can you shoot video can you record audio can you it's not just going to be enough to write your story you know if, if all you can do is write a story or edit a story that's great but you know i outlets are going to need people to do more i mean i know the full-time staff at the associated press the writers are basically not only writing their stories, they're selecting the art that goes along with it. Mm -hmm. So it's, we're kind of, we're, we're multitasking. Sure, and social media and all of that for sure. Yeah. All right, um, well, let's see if we can queue up some questions that the audience may have been asking you. Um, and uh, so you'll see them on the screen behind you and we'll just go off uh, any of them. But let's have... Uh, WP SBJ member Juliet Ruiz asked, did you choose to freelance or did you just fall into freelancing? Uh, I kind of sort of did, it was kind of sort of both. Uh, I worked for the New York Post for a long time and I, I got a little frustrated because I was, I had hit a glass ceiling and I wanted to do more and that opportunity wasn't coming my way. And I didn't want to be that bitter person that's in the newsroom constantly complaining that, oh, this place sucks, it's the worst place ever, uh, just, you know, it should burn down. I, I wanted to be the guy, I, I did not want to be that guy. I wanted to be someone... Escalated who, quickly. Yeah, it did. It really ramped up, uh, jumped up a notch. Yeah. <laughs> so I wanted to be, I wanted to succeed or fail on my own merits, not because someone saw something or didn't see something in me. Sure. All right. Uh, we get a lot of variation of this kind of question, which is something I was going to ask you, but John Fiorino, who just spoke at the beginning, our yeah. secretary of WPSBJ, what is the most memorable game you've covered in your time as a sports writer? I would probably say Game 6, 2012 Eastern Conference Finals, Devils Rangers, the game where Adam Henrique scored in overtime. Um, it's because of such an emotional series, Rangers and the Devils, and then... Adam Henry back sends a backhands a puck past Henrik Lundqvist. Half the building's elated, the other half is just devastated. It's just this unbelievable cauldron of noise. Um, plus any of the two Stanley Cup final finals I've covered, those those are really cool. Hmm. Yeah, uh, and I'm wondering also in those situations, are you? almost like rooting for a certain team? Not obviously you're staying objective, but are you kind of rooting for the story, the storyline that you think is best as a writer? I mean, you, you want to have the best possible story, but, you know, and I think that's what all writers and all reporters root for, the best possible story. I, you know, you, you never root for a team because um, then, then, you're, then you're a biased news source. Um, but yeah, you, you know, you've had... You know, would it have been cool if Rangers and Devils had gone to a Game 7? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Those two teams hated each other that year, and the games were great in a winner-take-all game, and you get to ride it. it, it how cool would that have been? All right, sure. Um, so this is from our president, Maynard Castillo, asks, how do you write a story during a live game? You just kind of, you know, you end up taking notes during the game, and then, you know, uh, something happens. Uh, Henrik Lundqvist makes a save or a series of saves. You, you, you kind of write that down uh, in, in, the time, in the time frame. Or Taylor Hall scores a goal. And you kind of write that down and kind of you build off of that. Mm -hmm. And you just kind of keep writing throughout the game. And obviously then you may write a lead that you think is going to be your game story lead. Yeah. And then something yeah. happens in the last minute of the game, last seconds of the game, with other team scores, and now your whole game story is constantly changing, right? Yeah. Well, there was a game 
a few weeks ago, I guess, where the Detroit Red Wings played the New York Islanders at the Barclays Center, and six minutes to go, I believe the Red Wings were up 4-2, to two, and the Islanders scored four straight goals to go up 6-5, six, six, and then one of the Red Wings scored with 30 seconds left to make it 6-6, six, six, and... Brock Nelson scored like 30 seconds into overtime to win the game. And I had pretty much my story written with five minutes to go. It was, you know, the Red Wings win this game and, you know, they scored three goals in the first period and cruised to an easy victory. And then all of a sudden I'm rewriting everything on the fly. And I, I remember I called in, I sent in my first version story and whoever edited me, I said, I sent you something that might resemble English. I, my, my right through will be better. Mm -hmm. And there's kind of that understanding, I guess, with editor and reporter in that situation when you're writing on such a tight deadline and things are constantly in motion. Yeah, uh, a, a friend of ours said, I think last week or two weeks ago, an editor on deadline can deal with garbage. They can't deal with not having copy. Mm -hmm. If you can send them something that's garbage, they can work and massage it and make it better if you send them nothing there's nothing they can do they you know and then that's when they're going to call you screaming because you've negatively negatively affected their job sure um okay uh we have this question here from matt singh do you think that you have succeeded we want you to get philosophical here yeah. you talked about reaching your goals is this it for you or are you wanting to explore more in journalism? Yeah, I think you always want to explore more. You always want to do more. I mean, if you're really uh, ambitious, you just don't want to be, you know, I, that guy that's uh, that person that's that's uh, putting their feet up and saying, "Okay, I've accomplished everything. There's more to do." Um, if my bosses came to me tomorrow and said, "We want to offer you a full-time job," being our National Hockey National Hockey League's National Hockey Writer, where you're kind of going on the road traveling and doing longer form feature stories, I think that would be cool. If they said, we want you to be, we want you to write politics. Okay, yeah, I, I would be interested in that. It's, mm -hmm. I, I think, I'm always trying to do more. So, yeah, I, I don't think this is it for me. That's interesting because also we often associate you know, people get kind of typecast like you're a sports writer and that's all you're going to do with sports, but you're saying you might be interested in being a political reporter too? Yeah, I mean, I think I think the best reporters can do it all, right? In the, you know, you, if you can write, because everything is based in news, you know, and from there, you know, sports is just a, um, a specialty, politics is a specialty, but the foundation of everything is news. So if you can write news, I think you're golden, mm -hmm. um, and and really you can have really interesting conversations with people in in press boxes about things other than sports. I mean, I mean obviously, you know what a team is doing is going to kind of take precedence, but you're going to end up talking about you know did you see this story? Did you see that story? Uh, did you see what Trump's doing today? You know all those things kind of get talked about. Because, after, because it, it's like ice cream. You might like chocolate ice cream. You might not like chocolate ice cream if you have to eat a gallon of it a day, every day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's certainly a lot of similarities between sports and political reporting. I've talked to classes about it. The conflict, which is yeah. both of them, right? They're, that's what both of those topics are all about. Um, we have some uh, boxing question here sure. for you from Joel Roman. If you have one choice, and I don't even know if I can pronounce all these guys' names, which boxing match would you cover? Anthony Joshua versus, is it Datani Wilder? Deontay. Deontay Wilder. And you can do the rest. Capel Wh Alvarez versus Glovkin. Um, <laughs> um, Alvarez Glovkin seems like that might be the fight of the year. So th that would be interesting. But I think he pulled out because of a failed drug test. So. That fight's not going to happen. Womp womp. Um, yeah. Yeah. Do you kind of think about that sometimes, though? I mean, we were talking about, like, dream matches or games that you, you're thinking about, like, dream pairings in boxing that you could cover or stuff I mean, makes it more interesting. I mean, I've done boxing. Uh, those kind of fights are, 
are, are happen in Las Vegas. At least the Alvarez Glovkin fight. So we ha we have a guy based in LA who who will fly out to Vegas for the big Vegas boxing matches or the big Vegas UFC fights. Mm -hmm. But um, would I like to do it? Sure, but I, I wish boxing was where it was in the '70s and '80s, where uh, we had these really major events. It, now it's because it's become kind of a secondary sport. We're kind of like horse racing, where mm. it's only important a couple times a year. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, okay, so we'll get in some questions from some other SPJ members here. We have our treasurer, Alex Evans, saying, what is one sporting event you would love to cover but haven't gotten a chance to do yet? I think U.S. Open Tennis, because that's literally right in my backyard. Mm -hmm. But it's it's always such a cool event. I think um, you know for two weeks, pretty much the city stops and comes out to Flushing Meadow Park, and and there's just so much real emotion behind the really great matches um, and the World Series. I think mm -hmm. I'd like to do a World Series just to say I've done it, and uh, and I think the Super Bowl as well. Do you think we're going to get a Mets Yankees World Series this year? No. Do you think we're going to get a Mets somebody World Series this year? No. <laughs> Is there any reason for me to continue in my existence then? Well, <laughs> I'm sure you get a paycheck for this. Okay, yeah, that's true. Um, okay, we have Jack Lonaker also from uh, SBJ who was with us on that Devil's Field trip. Yeah. As someone who's aspiring to be a professional sports journalist, what's a good place to start after graduating? What do you recommend for these guys? I would say go to journalismjobs.com. Go now. There, and they will have a lot of jobs, and it might be... It might be, you know, writing high schools or writing colleges, and it might not be in New York. It might be in Iowa or Idaho or wherever. But at least you'll get experience, and you'll get experience writing every day, and and editing, and learning how to work with editors. And I think that's so huge because, you know, working with editors here at the College Paper, they're your friends and. That's great, but you're going to be working with an editor who's going to say, I need 18 inches by 1030, you know, and you have to make sure you get him or her that story, and they're going to, and they're going to have questions about it. They're going to say, you know, did this person say this? You know, did this person really, you know, hit a three-pointer from three-quarters court, you know? Mm -hmm. Can you send me a box score? But yeah, I think those jobs are important. They, it, you get a, you gain experience that way. All right. So even if the paycheck isn't great to start, or the hours are long, or weekends, and we've had this discussion with many of the reality yeah. check guests, something that's worth uh, getting your shot. The the payoff is in the experience. Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, okay. We have uh, Jen McDonald asking, do you receive common questions from aspiring sports writers? I guess maybe something like from what we just got from Jack. But if so, what advice do you usually share with them? I mean, I, I tell everyone the same thing. Do your best work. Um, you know, if you, can, if you can feel comfortable with your process, that you, that, that you did everything by, they did everything properly, they did everything by the book, then you, then you did your job. Um, you know, I, obviously you, you want to strive to do the best possible work you can do, but I wouldn't necessarily kill yourself uh, if you have a story that just for whatever reason doesn't work out well. Sometimes you'll have a subject that's uncooperative or so you have a game that just literally nothing happens. Mm -hmm. and, and sometimes there's nothing you can do about it. You know, that someone else has the control. So if you can make your best, if you can do the best you can, I, I think you've done your job. How about, have you ever had to cover sports where you were very unfamiliar with the rules of the sport and you were still willing to sign up to give it a shot? Yeah. Uh, last summer I covered a uh, swimming with Ryan Lochte. It was his first time swimming prof uh, professionally after getting suspended after following his uh, stunt at the Olympics where he destroyed a bathroom. Mm -hmm. I had never covered a swim meet before. Um, so I basically had to study swimming pretty quickly you know, and then write about it because no one else was available and we needed the story. Mm -hmm. 
sometimes it's a willingness to do that or even doing, I guess, minor league or college, high school yeah. sports that other people aren't willing to cover but are still important to the people who are involved yeah. in that. Yeah, I mean, re re you know, readers, subscribers are st still going to say, hey, we need this story. So you have to be able to give it to them. You can't just say, well, I don't want to write it because I don't pay attention to it. Mm -hmm. That's not going to fly. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Ryan Doyle from SPJ and the editor-in-chief of our student newspaper, The Beacon, here, says, what are some unwritten rules of a pre- or post-game press conference? What should reporters not do in those situations? You don't want to make yourself the story, right? You, um, you know, I know there, there, there was a reporter a number of years ago, and Professor Hershon and I have talked about this. He talked to an Islanders player after a game where they lost badly, and... The guy said, "Well, you know, the opposing goalie could have read War and Peace in time. He could have take, he could have read War and Peace in time. It took you guys to get a shot on goal." Now he thought he was being funny. This, but the player was offended, and he complained to their PR staff. So, you, you know, and this guy has now been banned, and he has, <laughs> by the team, and has since written a lot of stupid columns complaining about how evil the public relations department is but and he's been banned by multiple teams by, by multiple teams this is not the only this team is he's not done the, this, to. this is not the only team he's done this to but i know it's sports and i know it's not life and death but these guys take what they do seriously they're professionals and when you lose a game six not a hockey game six nothing the last thing you want to be told by a reporter, when you don't really want to be in there, is like, boy, you guys really suck, mm -hmm. you know, which is what this guy did. Right. Um, you, so I think you want to be prepared. You want to ask smart questions, and you don't want to turn it into uh, into uh, your stand-up comedy routine. Mm -hmm. I think the big things there are sensitivity for the source, right? Yeah. Understand that even though it's not trauma, but they've lost a game, they got injured again, whatever it is, it's still something where you don't want to make light of it, certainly. Right. Um, and for athletes and coaches, like losing a game is a really bad it's a big, thing. It's a big deal. <laughs> uh, it puts them in a really bad mood. So be sensitive to that and then not making yourself a story as we talked about before, right? This is not a media event where then all of a sudden the attention should go on the reporters. Right. Um, all right, cool. Let's see if we have any other people. We didn't get in uh, Zach Finelli yet our newest WPSBJ member, saying, being a hardcore Pittsburgh sports fan, how has your experience been with the Tribune? Uh, I really like working for the Tribune Review. They're, you know, I've, I've had a good relationship with some of their previous staff and, and their current staff. Um, they've, they've treated me really, really well. They, they seem to trust me. I trust them. You know, it's not like I file a story and then, and then when I look, on the website later, they've completely rewritten it, you know, so, um, yeah, I can't say enough good things about the Tri Tribune Review. Hmm. And of course, you know, you want to have those kinds of good relationships because then word spreads really fast among those outlets, right, that you're a good, reliable sports writer because right. they talk and you want to be employed right. in all these places. Uh, we have a good one here from Joel. Have you ever faced a dull or hostile interview with an athlete or coach that you didn't expect it from? And how'd you deal with it? And we've had personal conversations about like some athletes and coaches where you kind of see them on TV and you get the sense, oh, that guy's a jerk. He's going to be difficult to deal with. But then there are the opposite or someone who yeah. maybe doesn't seem so great, but you find a way to make a connection with them as a reporter. Yeah. I mean, covering the Rangers, I've dealt with John Tortorella and, um, and actually I, uh, I've talked to other friends about this. I feel like John has was helped. the coach of the Rangers. Who was the coach of the Rangers, now the coach of the Columbus Blue Jackets. I feel he helped me up my game because if I didn't want to get embarrassed by this man, I had to ask him good questions and smart questions and prepared questions. And just to give you a little bit of context for those who may not be hockey or sports fans, John Tortorella is this notoriously mean, nasty kind of guy to reporters after games. And if they ask a question that he doesn't like, he'll just look at them like they're complete idiots and not answer it or give one-word answers or yeah. ask the other coach on the other team that question. I'm not going to talk about that. Yeah. So that's why Dennis is saying you really got to be well-prepared or you're going to get reamed out on TV by this guy. Yeah. 
Um, and as far as as far as a player, I didn't expect it from. I guess Derek Stepan during the 2013-2014 season when the Rangers went to the Stanley Cup final, they lost a game. I want to say either December or early January to Nashville, and they played really poorly. And they hadn't, and they had kind of been up and down for the first first like three three and a half months of the season, and this was just a game where. I thought they had leveled off and just hit rock bottom. Mm -hmm. So I, I asked him, I said, was this rock bottom for this group? And he didn't like the question. Um, and for about a couple of weeks, he just wouldn't talk to me. So what I just did was I said, look, I said, I'm going to let him calm down. And later we'll, we'll talk about it. And he basically, when he and I talked about it, he basically said he just, he didn't appreciate the question. He understood why I had to ask it. He just didn't like it. So, you know, and that's kind of the deal. Like sometimes guys aren't going to like a question you ask, but, but you still have, a certain respect there between right the reporter and the athlete. Right, but you still have to ask the question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, any times that you've had to intervene with the public relations arm of the team, and what's that relationship like? Because we haven't, you know, we've been talking a lot about interacting with the athlete and the coach, but obviously there is a whole. PR staff and some yeah. of the students here are probably PR major maybe interested in that kind of line of work. Yeah. Um, you try to develop a good relationship with the PR staff because they're essentially the go-betweens. You know, let's say you need to get a specific player or, you know, because that player is not available. If you have a good relationship with them, they're going to be more willing to help you out. Um, Recently, I did a story right after the NHL trade deadline where um, uh, I kind of examined the fact that New York Rangers have 10 draft picks in this year's draft and another nine next year. And I reached out to uh, the Rangers PR staff and they set me up with Chris Drury, who's the assistant general manager. And we had a 20 minute phone conversation essentially about what what you know what their philosophy is it's not just hey that they, we have that they have these 10 draft picks it's you have to maximize the value on the pick and then develop those players and you know what the what that process is like mm -hmm. but i can't get to talk to chris drury or anyone in that management team without going through the public relations department mm -hmm. and if i don't have a, a long standing long standing positive relationship with them that they know I'm not going to ask Chris Drury, boy, you guys really suck this year, huh? You know, if if I if they think I'm going to do that, they're never going to put me in touch with anyone in the organization. So you have to, they have to know that you're going to be professional. So we'll just take a few more questions to close out here. But uh, Juliet is asking, is there anything you try to do to get readers who aren't necessarily sports fans? Um, I mean, I I. I put my stuff out on Twitter and Facebook and all other social networks, and I try to be as interactive as possible. And I, I try not to just limit myself to talking to sports. Maybe it's pop culture. Maybe it's politics. Maybe it's you know, maybe it's tweeting out a very awful joke. <laughs> you know, uh, and you know, and then hopefully you know someone sees it. And you develop, you have a conversation, and if they follow you, great. If not, you've tried. Yeah, and we've seen kind of that merging of sports is always, of course, a part of pop culture, right, and society that people sometimes ignore, but it's a major aspect of it. But we're seeing that crossover now of things like Bill Simmons and yeah. whether it's The Ringer, you know, or his podcasts and all those sorts of things. He's kind of introduced that yeah, I mean, part of sports. Sports pop culture and society they're all intertwined i i made this point earlier that um you know when you talk about when people say well stick to sports well now's not the time to stick to sports because it's tied sports and politics and society have always been intertwined i mean uh you know when people talk about colin kaepernick and nfl players kneeling all you have to do is point at muhammad ali and then before that um uh, the 1960 Olympics in Rome with the with the track and field athletes. I mean, it, it's you know, and 
even things like the NHL lockout, that's, that's politics, that's business. You know, it, it's not just what happens on the ice or on the field. You know, there's always a different, there's always a story behind it. So if you want to be a sports writer, you want to be well-rounded and know about world events because if you need to know for the Colin Kaepernick story, what is he protesting? Right. What are the issues at play here? Um, and with the finance stuff, right? Because like you're saying, sometimes if the players are going to go on strike or the owners are going to lock them out or whatever the case may be. And sometimes you're also dealing with right nego salary negotiations yeah. for players, trades and salary caps. Yeah. Uh, so it's not as simple as just I go to the game and I write about the game. how fun the game was. Yeah. Right. I mean, I think the, uh, I th the, the assignment that I thought was probably the best experience I had and probably the most challenging experience was covering the 2012 NHL lockout because it forced me out of my comfort zone. I wasn't just writing about goals and assists and saves. I was writing economics. I was writing labor and, you know, and that's, that's real. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Let's see if we have um, one more. We'll end with Maria here. Uh, do you have a dream interview? I've thought about this question. Um, I have. <laughs> Taylor Swift. That's, that's enough. <laughs> um, JFK, John Kennedy, Barack Obama, and uh, Mahatma Gandhi. Wow. No athletes. No athletes. Do you have a dream athlete interview? Bill Russell. Okay. And why Bill Russell? Because he was more than just, um, I mean, as great, of an, as great an athlete as he was, he, w he was also very important in society. I mean, he, I mean he, he was one of the first athletes in Boston to really talk about race. And if you read his you know, autobiography, he was pretty, uh, pretty straightforward and pretty blunt about how he felt about Boston being a black man in Boston during the 50s and 60s. So I think that's, you know, I would be interested in, in finding out what he thinks about how society has evolved or maybe hasn't evolved mm. to this point. And the political figures you mentioned, why Kennedy, Gandhi, what, what I happened? mean, because, I mean, Gandhi, obviously, being uh, someone who preached nonviolence, I'd be interested in, in, in his thoughts on how we have evolved as, as people, you know, and where he thinks we need to go. And as far as Kennedy and Obama, just the challenges that they faced as presidents, um, you know, what it was like being president, because that, that's an exclusive club. Uh, 44 really intelligent men and one moron have held that office. And, um, and it would be... Don't pick on Millard Fillmore. He, he knows what he did. <laughs> and uh, they have held that office, and it would be just interesting to know their thoughts about it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I realized we were talking about sports, so let's go out. Let's get you uh, talking about some sports predictions. All right. So uh, NHL season is about to end. Who's your pick to go to the finals? Uh, from the east, I'll take the Tampa Bay Lightning. Mm -hmm. Popular pick. And from the west, I'll say the Winnipeg Jets. Oh, okay. That's a little surprising. And then who do you think is going to win that? I'll say Tampa Bay. I just... I think Winnipeg's really good. I just think Tampa Bay has better goaltending. Okay. And we determined earlier you don't think the Mets, even though they have an amazing starting rotation and lineup this season um, and fan base, uh, you don't think that they are going to make the World Series. So what teams do you think are going to be in the World Series? I'll say the Chicago Cubs and the Yankees. Okay. Uh, you're going to make some people happy here with that. So, And who do you think comes away from that? Giancarlo and the Yankees? I think Giancarlo and the Yankees. Okay. Um, and then we are approaching WrestleMania weekend, and I know that you're also a wrestling fan. So Shinsuke, AJ Styles, who do you think is going to come I think on? Nakamura. <laughs> really? Yeah. Um, do you, and I should just say, because you are obviously a, uh, a wrestling fan, that's kind of funny because obviously it's not legitimate sport, it's scripted sport, but yeah. uh, you still... As a sports writer who's a you know, self-respecting sports writer, you still enjoy that product. Right, because it's, it, you, can, you can enjoy the athleticism and, 
and and what and what these guys do because what these guys and women do it's it it is physically demanding you know so you can appreciate that mm -hmm. sure very fun well thank you very much Dennis. <laughs>